Hello, hi there. Uh, my name is Pete Blint. Um, I'm from NFX. And so today I'm really excited to talk about our investment thesis around fintech enabled marketplaces. So um, this is 2.0, really, because uh, three years ago we gave an original presentation here, uh, which is where we coined the term fintech enabled marketplaces. And this whole idea, this whole theme about embedded finance was was very new back then, but it expanded and really we've seen it become a core component of marketplace. In fact, I think pretty much every marketplace we've invested in over the last year or so has been what we call as a, a fintech enabled marketplace. Um, just before we jump in, just a sort of quick background to, to NFX. So NFX is a, a seed fund, a pre-seed and seed fund. We have um, headquarters in, in Silicon Valley and office, offices in Israel. Um, kind of what sets us apart and makes us different. Um, one is we're the largest seed fund, dedicated seed fund out there, um, at 450 million, which we announced shortly ago, short a, a few months ago. Um, we're a team of operators um, that we've collectively found, found it's in like 10 companies with north of $10 billion in valuation. Um, and NFX stands for network effects. So we love marketplaces. We love um, networks, we love platforms. Um, it's really just the core of our thesis. And, and then personally, um, I was part of the founding team at lastmin.com in Europe, a big web 1.0 travel marketplace. And then in the US founded Trulia and ran that as CEO for, until it merged with, with Zillow to create the world's largest online real estate marketplace. So let's jump in. So what do we mean by, um, by FinTech enabled marketplaces? So really at the heart is deeply embedding financial services uh, products into a marketplace itself to the extent that they often become invisible and make core and create an enormous value as a consequence and become invisible and often build these breakthrough product experiences. So we know the internet really did a remarkable job in um, in changing the way you discover goods and buy goods and really the at the heart of the innovation the last five years or so has been the transaction. And we really see these fintech enabled marketplaces changing the nature of that transaction. And, and if you think about it, the, the way that um, the way that financial services work, they're often fueled by data. And one of the big challenges is customer acquisition. The thing is the marketplaces often have a ton of data and you have a steady stream of, of, of customers, either supplier side or demand side. So we really see the, the financial services component becoming a necessary component of, um, of these big marketplaces. And a lot of this data really fueling this, this underwriting to create these ultimately what we see as breakthrough product experiences. So this is really how we see the, the evolution of, of marketplace businesses over the last several decades. So we started with lead gen, transactional managed marketplaces, and now fintech marketplaces. And kind of the, there's this sort of relentless drive in constantly improving the, the consumer experience or customer experience. And then moving closer and closer to the transaction, which often means extracting or, 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 or increasing the take rate uh, within all these marketplaces. So let's just dive in with a few examples. So let's just take food delivery. We've gone from City Search, which is really a lead gen business, to Yelp, vertical lead gen business, to these, um, these pure um, uh, managed marketplaces. And then we see, a, you know, there are some emerging kind of more fintech enabled businesses built on top of that. It's very clear in, in vacation rentals, um, the similar trend from horizontal to transactional. And then you have a company like Picasso, which launched, uh, I think about 18 months ago, um, where, where you're enabling uh, consumers to really have um, buy an ownership stake in these particular um, vacation rentals that they they have a component, they have a, a, a share of. Um, you've obviously seen it in, in real estate, um, where you're seeing this evolution from lead gen through to pure transactional services. And at the heart of the problem really is this notion of misaligned incentives. So if you take trading your car, for instance, um, most of the participants have different incentives. So a dealer may be primarily interested in selling a car at the highest price. The trading team wants to buy your car at the, the lowest cost uh, to you, to them. The financing team wants to sort of maximize the APR, and all these all these participants have these very misaligned and different incentives. So um, this is incredibly horrible. This is massively horrible and horrible friction, and a bunch of misaligned incentives, which really creates this opportunity. So we've seen a bunch of catalysts here that have really been accelerated by by COVID. So 
Um, firstly, consumers are craving a much better digital experiences and immediacy. Um, in, in marketplaces, the money is already flowing. Um, this data and really understanding this data is um, very well established. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of enabling technologies. And I think one of the, the big things that over the last year or so has been not just the infrastructure layers that have been more, more established and more developed, but increasingly Web3 technologies and Web3 um, principles, which are being applied to some of these market crazy, market marketplaces, which we see as a really interesting opportunity over the next several years, as Web3 technologies start to permeate really everything that we do, and certainly marketplaces. Um, so really summarizing quickly some of the key identif- key advantages of marketplaces, and, and we've, we've added, added one since we um, sort of came up with it thesis. So one is capturing demand side by removing friction. Really, the um, breakthrough experience by by taking these really cumbersome and complicated multi-process transactions from transaction and financing to to take out friction. Ribbon, an NFX company, is a great example of that where um, they've really built a platform to work with brokers and mortgage lenders to take out this friction to help you to manage your financing and often buy buy before you sell and also take out certainty of the the transaction. Um, And before I forget, we will have time for questions at the end. So um, feel free to, to ask questions and I'll answer them at the end. Um, secondly, is unlocking latent supply. So using capital and data um, uh, to, to unlock supply. This could be using using insurance services, um, you're using insurance products to, to unlock that supply or capital itself. So um, in Latin America, La House, which is the leading uh, online real estate service for Latin, for Spanish speaking Latin America um, uses capital to really to, to unlock supply for new developments that are coming on board. Um, and it's and it's doing incredibly well by, by doing that in Mexico and Colombia. Reduce multi-tenanting by um, really expanding the relationship with customers. So this can be payments or traditional banking experience. The, the, the sort of classic example here has been um, within Square, who've done an incredible job in moving into into different areas, um, which has been a you know the, the success of the company is is really hard to ignore, and they're they're moving into all these services in addition to just this core idea of, of SMB uh, payment services. Um, eliminating misaligned incentives. We kind of talked about this about the in the car example. Um, there are many other interesting examples that we can see that that you start to combine these 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 product experiences. And these misaligned incentives start to to evaporate. Um, Subsidizing um, products, really, really bundling um, services. So you start to see um, LTV advantages here by bundling, but also potentially some reduction in friction as well. Often enabling a new entrant to outspend an incumbent on marketing if they are able to to, um, to, to, to bundle these multiple services. Um, and then finally, um, a big area that we're, we're very excited about is tokenizing the network to align incentives and drive participation. Um, so launching a token on the supplier side and the demand side to ena- enable the participants of that marketplace to get ownership in their network and often governance in their network. So these tokens can, can reward activity on the platform, tradable, obviously reducing multi-tenanting, and then can also to, to provide a an initial kickstart to, to, to get liquidity to, to, to sort of to solve that cold start or chicken egg problem. Um, and that early virality can be seen as really a, a sort of crucial component. And we see a lot of the opportunity over the next several years is, is adding, as we said, some of these web three components into perhaps we might see in a web two businesses or looking at um, or entirely new experiences that wouldn't exist without these that this token. Uh, tokenization of the network. Um, an example here might be Brain Trust, which is a de- calls itself a decentralized talent network, somewhat similar to Upwork or or A Teams. And really, the community relies on on Brain Trust to find the work, and the network is only governed by the same people that that build it. So, really, it's sort of a traditional um, um, a traditional marketplace in the sense that these sort of models been around, but They've managed to kickstart the network 
by by incorporating this token. Um, so I, so while we love the the um, the marketplace and stuff, there has been a growth of platform opportunities which have been um, really hard to ignore. And so I think we're very familiar with many of the names here. Are the platforms that have been enabling a lot of this um, these opportunities, and I think that there this is a fairly mature area, but um, you've seen how many of these these businesses have become enormous uh, or many of these platforms have become in enormous areas but there's still a, a bunch of opportunities to 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 explore so and this whole thing has been accelerated by covid so we've 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 seen an increasing need for digitization we've seen a uh, a real big desire for cash and flexibility from uh, b2c and b2b which is they're looking for innovative um, uh, specialty financial products incorporated with a transaction. And then customers are craving convenience, um, which all this has really produced a dramatic acceleration of digitization and then and then particularly digital commerce, which is aiding growth of these, these marketplaces. So what's working? What is the stuff that we're, we're seeing working? So first of all, we, we're starting to see just this incredible rise of Web3 and crypto, both on the infrastructure side um, and there's a ton of different components there um, and different protocols and, and different, uh, different tokens that we can see building out the building blocks of the, this decentralized future. And then also a number of, of marketplaces or, or, or even decentralized marketplaces that, that, that are really starting with often digital native products. Um, so you could think of NFTs as just the, the most obvious example, but there's a lot of digital native um, uh, uh, crypto uh, products and marketplaces, which are scaling at remarkable speed. Um, and so this is a, a really fascinating area. Um, secondly, international. So <clears throat> I think really that the kind of the thesis here is that you've seen that the financial infrastructure, as well as the financial products in, in non-US markets in particular, um, have been are just less developed. There's a lot more friction, a lot more um, process um, and so that creates opportunities both for um, uh, that creates opportunities both for the um, infrastructure build out um, which has been very active over the last several years um, and then also incorporating that into financial products and you can often see that these marketplaces themselves have superior economics principally because the financial services are incredibly high friction um, and incredibly cumbersome to to um, to navigate. Um, and there's often, you know, in some cases, um, not in every country, but in in some cases, there's less regulatory burden that makes it easier to to combine these marketplaces um, with a um, th these marketplaces with these financial services. So um, you see examples. I was recently in in Latin America, and you see a number of examples. So Cavac the the used car marketplaces has very significant fintech component that's doing super well. Nuvo Cargo, which really is a um, digitized logistics network, again, is providing a, a meaningful um, financial services component, both insurance as well as potential credit. And then also the there's opportunities around, um, and, and we mentioned the house, which is the Spanish speaking uh, online real estate leader, which is also incorporating finance from the consumer side, but also the supplier side. Um, B2B marketplaces, you've seen the sort of, you know, where businesses have taken consumer principles and applied it to, um, to B2B services. We're seeing um, really a, a kind of well-developed playbook here where, you know, the core of it is, is access to inventory, which is often differentiated by pricing and data insights. Um, Easy payments, payment services, and and often in these these B two B transactions because they're outside of the traditional credit card. There are innovative financial uh, products, or also just integration with uh, various enterprise um, payment systems or approval systems. So we start to see just that friction being removed by, removed by financing services, um, which aids the liquidity in the marketplace, and often superior service, which is. You know, for for physical goods, often differentiated by delivery options. So where where we see a lot of the really attractive components here is where the the marketplaces are non-commoditized, 
new supplies being created, fragmented markets, and there's this financing friction. So a um, couple of examples from NFX's portfolio, Acto, or Octo, which is um, in the sort of used heavy goods, and then Move, which is in the fab space. That's a large silicon fab, which has seen obviously a huge amount of tailwinds over the last several years with the, the, the supply chain challenges in the chip industry. Payment platforms, you know, I, th I think folks are kind of very familiar, but the staggering thing here has just been the growth in the valuations of, in these companies in the last two, three years. So the BMPL space, I think it's been uh, well discussed, um, but it's remarkable. Um, and it feels like these companies uh, and platforms have really significant upside to grow from here. So what's not working? So I thought um, I would use this example really to sort of pick on uh, pick one company and one case study. So a uh, world that I know reasonably well. Um, so two weeks ago, we saw this news, like news trickling out of Zillow, which they're shutting down their the iBind program. So cutting 25% of their workforce, that the iBind program Zillow offers really going head to head with, with Open Door. Um, and Zillow offers lost something, you know, 420 million, I think. Um, you can see from this slide that they cut 25% of the work, workforce. Um, and what seemed like a really um, exciting, compelling um, fin fintech component to this traditional marketplace really looked um, from at least the news and the stock, um, a really disastrous detour. Um, and so we'll, you know, we'll, we'll sort of double click on that for a bit, but, you know, net, net, this is freaking hard. Um, you kind of look at these businesses and say, oh, yeah, we just had a fintech component, but it's actually a lot harder than it looks um, when competing with someone perhaps that, that has it at the core. Um, so kind of what, what went wrong? When you asked Arcillo there um, and the public statements, their comments was that <clears throat> the, the ability or the, um, the, the sort of algorithm to forecast future prices is much harder than it looks, or the cap they didn't really develop that capability. So, but the reality, and the reality, just just sort of what's going on here is that i buying is really like a, a regular lending business. Um, you know, in, in these businesses, and certainly i buying, you start to see your winners really early on. You know, you you buy a home, you renovate it, you sell it. If it happens, if that sells happen quickly, you got to start to see the winners really early on. Um, but over time. Um, properties that perhaps didn't sell, they're still in the market, have carrying costs. You have to cut prices to sell them, often below the price you bought, you start to see these losses. So, you know, in the early days of the cohorts, things look great. In the latter days, um, things can look very, very different. Um, and then and then Zillow themselves, the, the AVM is actually um, statistically very, very good. Um, but it's really designed for one particular product, which is to attract consumers. Open Door developed a, uh, an internal valuation model, which is very precise for the particular thing that it's trying to do. Um, and I think on the surface, if you look at, you know, if, you're, if your Zessima is 1% off, it's not really a huge deal. Um, you know, you, you sort of expect it to be a little bit off. But if you're buying a home for 1% less than it's actually worth, that means losing thousands of, a of, uh, few thousand dollars in every sale. And that, if you're buying, 5,000 homes a quarter, that escalates very significant into a very significant sum very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, going back to um, Zillow's uh, original um, uh, investor uh, day pitch, when they when they presented this, um, this sort of heavy shift into iBuying, uh, where they went all in, you can see that they were buying homes initially at essentially zero margin. Um, uh, and you know that the sort of the theory was predicated on the ability to upsell or, or to get efficiency at scale, but then also to to upsell um, into additional products because the, that could be mortgage renovation, title, etc. Um, so net net, you have to put a huge amount of capital risk to make this work, and the cross selling opportunities are often overstated in many of these these businesses. You combine that with this exceptional ramp. Um, so you saw home, you know, from, from their internal metrics, or their, their published metrics, they were doubling, at least doubling the volume of homes sold every single quarter. Um, 
And if you don't have the longitudinal view of these cohorts over a long period of time, and you combine it with this uh, aggressive ramp at a sort of near zero margin opportunity, it's um, uh, it's perhaps not surprising that things went wrong. Um, and then the, the last really lesson from, from Z the Zillow situation is one of culture. Um, you know, Z Zillow is a, as a sort of seeing the threat and an existential threat from, from Open Door, they were very concerned that Open Door would build out a proprietary listing database and use this iBuying platform to have that proprietary supply. And they should be, they should be concerned. And so they were determined, kind of as the the number one and as an aggressive player to to grow and and, and move very fast. Um, so they were they're very focused on the speed issue. Um, and the other is just the sort of core DNA component um, of, of building these businesses. So um, companies, marketplace businesses, um, you know, they they generally have a really good um, software DNA, but certainly um, these fintech enabled marketplaces, they need to have a very, very strong data DNA and often an extremely strong operational DNA, which is often quite different from the core DNA. Which is what's been helped with, which has helped that company to be successful in the first place. Um, and ultimately, I think that the question that many founders should be asking themselves is: should they partner, or should they, um, uh, should they not partner? Um, and I think the, you know, many, particularly if you think of someone, I think Zillow, um, before the um, reduction, had something like eight thousand employees. You kind of think, okay, and it's worth. Somewhere in 15, 20 billion dollars. Like on the surface, you think, oh, they can do this, they can execute on this, but it's actually a very different business to get into. And so you can, you know, while it, you know, you might while you might complain about the as an existing uh, marketplace to go into this, this area is challenging. Um, the uh, you know, I think the lessons from Zillow is that uh often partnering um or or doing this with um with someone else, maybe the more effective disaster, or in fact, you know, acquiring a company to um, to fill this capability. Which, if you don't have that core DNA in place, it can be very hard to to add it. Um, so, finally, and before we wrap up and and take some Q and A, just talk a little bit about some of the opportunities ahead. So, um, as we've shared, we we are very excited about um, uh, the transition from of businesses from web two to web three. Um, you know, as, as a firm, we have a lot of expertise around web two, and then we've added, um, uh, we've long been sort of fascinated with crypto and investors in crypto. And then Morgan Bella from, who was part of the team that's created Libra and Novi, uh, joined us about a year ago, really to strengthen and deepen our, our focus and expertise in, in web three and crypto. And we see a lot of these, um, uh, you know, perhaps Web two marketplaces incorporating a Web three component, which can add to that scale and liquidity, um, which enables them to, to, to by tokenizing the, the network, can can really create a potentially a um, an advantage, which could enable them to unseat their their Web two competitor, or you know, probably in the more likely we see in the next several years to um, uh, to build you know in the near term to build new entirely new digitally native um, product experiences, which we haven't seen before. So we think that area is um, extremely compelling. Uh, and you see a lot of the infrastructure being built out um, or, and then additional components and additional platforms we've built out as well. Um, we, uh, when I say FinTech products that can become platforms, really what I, um, what I see is a lot of the opportunities within um, the sort of FinTech infrastructure layer to enable uh, marketplaces, they can be very hard to scale. Um, you see many of them, which are kind of almost like mini consulting projects, which may be a way to start, but we're really excited about ones that can scale into become products and platforms and more easily embedded into them. Payments is done and, and BNPL um, really have been products that have been productized and scaled very efficiently. And there's certainly others out there that um, startups can build. But the really is the scalability and productization of those fintech products, where we think is is very exciting. Um, we see a lot of um, significant opportunity in in global opportunities that could be 
Europe, um, it could be Latin America, it could be Asia, other parts of the world. Um, but given the often sort of the laggards in financial services, we see the, the fintech enabled marketplace opportunities in those more emerging countries as being often superior to those that in the US where there's more competition and there's more established financial services products out there. So that's extremely large opportunity. And then, and then finally, fintech B2B marketplaces um, are really of all kinds um, against the sort of backdrop of what I shared around non-commoditized, unlocked new supply, um, financing friction, um, and I forget the other component, but it but it was on the slides. Um, so with that, we have a few minutes left. I'll um, open up to questions that the folks have. And I think there's um, a few questions here. Um, so uh, can you share, so this question from Sundar, um, can you share your views on NFTs and the role in marketplaces? Um, so I think I shared a little, little bit uh, since the, the question was asked. Um, you know, I think the, you know, where, I guess where you look at some of the, the rapidly growing, um, you know, crypto marketplaces has been in, in NFTs, which you can, you know, these are sort of digitally native um, products and we see much more opportunities in this sort of pure, um, uh, rather, rather than perhaps, another way of saying is perhaps rather than you see um, companies that are, you know, adopting a crypto component for, for some particular reason, these pure digital native um, uh, crypto and NFT platforms being rapidly growing. Off, you know, I, an example might be that, Again, let's take the real estate industry. It's like, in theory, Title is a perfect NFT or blockchain um, product. You know, the authentication that you have ownership of a particular piece of land. The reality is that the system, while it doesn't really work very well, it works. And the sort of risk associated with transforming that is um, is such high friction of very traditional industry. The, the ownership opportunity is much more interesting in a digitally native art or NFT. And so we've seen much more um, rapidly rapidly growing evolution there. Um, let's, um, can you elaborate a bit on subsidized product and marketing piece? What would be an example? Um, so I guess a, a simple example would be bundling insurance with a transaction. So um, this has been done for some time, but making, you know, if you're, if you're a consumer or a supplier, Adding an insurance component um, may mean that you can have higher CAC from someone that wasn't offering those insurance products. And often in certain categories, that insurance product has to be created out of scratch. So if you're able to, to provide that insurance product, then you have higher LTV, which means that you can have higher CAC. That would be an example there. Um, would Great presentation. Would we share the slides for later? Possibly. If subscribe to NFX and if, we, if there's enough demand. Um, then um, certainly we can release it. Um, uh, Token-based market, next question. Um, Token-based marketplaces is complicated to understand. Need to define the protocol of governance. Um, uh, I think, so the question is like how to build um, token-based marketplaces. I think this is, um, I guess, watch this space. There's, a, there's my partner, James Courier is speaking later on. Um, he'll be talking about some of this, some of these components, but watch this space. Um, perhaps it might be easier to subscribe to NFX's email because we'll be publishing a lot in this area. Um, and then finally, what are your tips with regard to build by partner process and marketplace technology platform? Um, I what are your tips? Um, I mean, generally we would sort of recommend. Uh, building, um, we, I don't think we would, uh, we would, we would support. You know, as a as a venture capital firm, we we much prefer companies that are building their own platforms. Um, in terms of partnering with various services, I think there's, you know, there will be a fairly traditional process to to work through um, to um, uh, to sort of evaluate those those options. Um, so I think my time has kind of run up. Um, so, um, you know, maybe with that, um, I will, um, 
thank you for listening. Um, I'll try and flip to the last slide. Um, and um, there's my email address and Twitter handle. Um, sign up for more news from NFX about what we're doing. And then listen to my partner, James Courier uh, from NFX, who's speaking in a bit. And thank you all for your time today. Take care.